Well, I am excited, truly excited, to have Mr. Kelly Stites, proprietor, CEO, and owner of uh, Valley Dynamo, the iconic tornado foosball table. The first time on our in our media that we've had a table manufacturer, uh, Mr. Stites, are you there, sir? Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is probably long overdue. On behalf of Inside Foos and really the foosball community, we couldn't be more elated to get a peek behind the curtain. And uh, I mean that. And, and part of the agenda here is to humanize you, Mr. Stites, in terms of the community doesn't really know you. Uh, we probably should know more about you, and it's probably our burden to to uh, know you better. But uh, you, you offering yourself up like this to answer some questions is really exciting for the whole community. So thank you. You bet. My pleasure. So to get started here, sir, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, one of the uh, one of the things that I think somebody had mentioned to me that they were curious about was my favorite movie. And uh, <laughs> I think this is a no-brainer, so hopefully everybody will agree with me. I've watched this movie many times. It's actually a trilogy, and I'm, I could watch it again today and still make me laugh. It's the Austin Powers series. <laughs> I think the world would do us some good right now with everybody stressed out that we all just watch all three of those movies sometime this week. What was amazing about that series, sir, is that how they got uh, every cameo of every person ever. Uh, Steven Spielberg, Tom Cruise, right? Everybody cameoed in that thing. Yeah. Fantastic. Now that we're talking about it, I may end up watching it again tonight. I (laughs) I hadn't watched it in probably a year. That's awesome. me personally, uh, you know, I guess I'm a little bit of a redneck because I live here in Texas and we all have a little bit of that in us. But, you know, things that I like to do, like personally, is I'm, I'm a bow hunter and uh, I got into archery about 10 years ago and I'm eating up with it, man. I just love it. So I've got a ranch up north of here on the Red River and I'm probably there one or two days every week. Wow. So during deer season, I hunt deer. And then year round, we have a hog problem here in Texas. So uh, I'm shooting hogs. So it doesn't get much more redneck than that. <laughs> I do play golf. I'm not very good. So, uh, you know, most of my friends are happy to take money from me. Yeah. But, but the thing that I thought would be interesting that maybe some of your players would like to know is that I'm an avid shuffleboard player. Mm. And uh, I have a shuffleboard here at my house. I have one at the ranch. And starting in 77, 1977, I started playing at a bar called Farkleberries in College Station, Texas, Texas A&M. And uh, I played for years and I got out of college and I actually joined the league and I played in a shuffleboard league for seven years. And then started a family and when my kids were young my wife really wouldn't let me out of the house much at night so uh i took off about oh i don't know 14 15 years and then i actually got back in it and played again for about another five years so all you guys that play in the uh you know in the leagues and the tournaments i've done all that i went to the tournaments traveled to those and did the league play so uh i get it you know i get it all and it's really important to me as an individual and also as our company we really understand uh the league and the tournaments so um i I do love um you know right now i mean i'm probably playing i know shuffleboard's not foosball but it's all kind of the same family when you talk about a sport like that yeah and uh so i've been playing that for i'm gonna say over 40 years wow and and still love the game now my wife is a pretty decent foosball player huh she she played when she was younger and i don't know if people even know this but her dad my father-in-law started dynamo in his garage here in texas wow so i don't know if you were aware of that so she played as a young person and if you you know if she went to a tournament i mean she's not going to do very well but if she went into a local bar and just played some local she could hold her own that's great no i i I think it's Really, really interesting because there is something about these table type games, and for lack of a better description, in the United States they're mostly identified as bar games because you you find them in bars. It's not necessarily that way in other parts of the world, but I think there's something similar about these narrow space games, these bar games where they're intimate, 
and their close yeah. proximity. And so you competed. And may I ask, I don't know, did you compete at a novice or expert or amateur level in shuffleboard? Well, there's a rating system that we have. I mean, I'm still rated right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm a, what they call a two. I don't know how that corresponds into the foosball world. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, when I go to a tournament, I'm on the lower end of the skill level. Mm-hmm. If I were to go into Joe's Bar and Grill, I mean, there's a good chance I'm not going to lose a game. No, no, So this is great. The reason why I'm getting to this is at the competitive level where foosball is simultaneously nuanced but very similar to other these other sports, whether it's darts or shuffleboard or any kind of um, intensely tight skill game. Can you talk a little bit about how the pressure affects you in competitive shuffleboard, the decision-making, the tension, the motor skills, and how that changes when the pressure is on? Can you tell, tell us a little bit of experience about shuffleboard at the competitive level? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the difference between shuffleboard and foosball is in shuffleboard, we have a long time between shots mm. to really evaluate it and think about the strategy. It's not what I would call a fast paced game by any means, but probably a lot like foosball, there's a lot of strategy in it. And when you talk about the pressure, it's it, it weighs in like it does in any sport. I mean, when the pressure's on and it's that last shot that you have to make, those, we call them weights, a lot of people call them pucks, but they're tough to hit. Mm-hmm. And and the pressure, I've seen where I've made mental mistakes when the pressure's on too, not thinking clearly. Even though we can take two or three minutes to think about the shot, what we want to do before we shoot it. So it still weighs in. Now, foosball's a different animal. You know, those the people that are playing foosball have got to react so quickly. And, um, you know, we... so. We, we have that luxury in shuffleboard again where we can take our time. You know, there, it is and it isn't different. And I'll tell you why. We talk a lot about this in competitive circles. We talk about it on the podcast. We talk about it on our downtime. The physical skill of what we do, yeah, sure, there's training and there's hours you need to put in and there's developmental skill. But overall, we are talking about rods and plastic men and a ball. And so the amount of strength, like I don't want to disparage the technique. There's tons of technique. However, at the end of the day, we're talking about very minimal exertion overall. And uh, just like it is, it's all similar, we talk about um, soccer penalty kicks and how all the research done when the pressure is on, these penalty kicks that are typically very simple for these um, uh, men and women to execute – now the ball's going way far left and way far. Right. It can't even hit the ball straight. So whether it's shuffleboard where you're, you're, you know, you're dancing the puck across the way there, which takes minimal effort, the level of execution is no different in between the years. It's no different. That's true. That's true. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a, there, I, I would think if you look at the top Oh, 20 players in the world. Actually, probably five of them live here in Texas, actually. Mm. So I get to watch these people play. But if you want to set a puck at the end of the table, they're all going to hit it. And they're all going to hit it and make me leave that, that weight to the left or the right. They can all execute evenly, physically. And what it comes down to is being able to play under the pressure. Mm-hmm. And it comes under the strategy. A lot of there's a lot of strategy on what you're going to do in that game, and that's what separates the winners from the losers at that level. Hey, I got to ask you because I want to draw the analogy. Do you feel the same level of um, you know you start your your oxygen changes and your breathing changes when you're trying to make a shot and when you're hunting? Does that shot get a little bit more difficult when you're? Go ahead. Well, that's a great analogy right there, and I'll tell you. I still get so excited. The first time that a buck came in and I was going to shoot it with a bow, and I like the bow hunting because it's a lot more difficult and challenging than rifle hunting. And the first time that one came in, I literally sat there and I was breathing and I could not pull Mm -hmm. most like, and people have said that before, and I I really didn't believe them. And I literally sat there and I could not pull back. I couldn't draw back. And even today... You do. You start breathing heavy, uh-huh. and um, the pressure's on, and and it's you know it's tough. And I made it. I make. I'm, I still make mistakes right now shooting. But if you put a target out there, and it's me and you dusting around yeah. at twenty yards. Yeah, I'm going to shoot every arrow in a three to four inch circle without any question. Yeah, bring a deer in there at twenty yards. Yeah, I probably am not going to miss it, 
but there's a good chance I can make a bad shot. I will tell you right now, we have that in common, sir, at any competitive level, or even when you're competing against yourself, and the foosball community will appreciate that about you, that the, the endeavors you have, that's a, a similarity that binds us, dealing with pressure, executing under pressure, and, and making the right decision and um, the right choice, and doing it with poise and composure. And that's kind of the addictive property about foosball, and I'm sure, I'm sure shuffleboard. Those moments, the highs and lows, especially the highs when the pressure's on and hitting the perfect shot, is uh, something that compels us to be addicted to these types of things in the, in the healthiest of ways. Right. Yeah, I think you're yeah spot on. That's exactly correct. I got I got to ask you one more thing though, and this is for me. I've I, one time I called a hillbilly a redneck, and I think he wanted to beat me into the earth. And I for for the for the for our patrons listening now, can you is there a way you could differentiate or define for us the difference between a hillbilly and a redneck? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know that there is that much of a difference here, <laughs> okay. here in Texas. You yeah. know, it, it's a badge of honor. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah. you know, that's it's just kind of a way of life. It depends on where you grow up. Like, I mean, I drive a truck, uh-huh. and uh, I could probably drive, you know, a, a variety of different cars if I wanted to. It's just a lifestyle, and, <laughs> you know, that's the way it is here. And I'm sure in different parts of the, of the country and also different parts of the world, it's all just kind of depending on your surroundings and how you grow up. I think I offended. I think I offended the gentleman because he was born in the hills or lived in the hills, and I guess you can't call a hillbilly a redneck if they grew up in the well, hills. I consider. I didn't really want to go into this, but I, <laughs> I kind of consider people from Alabama hillbillies. Okay. Now I just met a couple of great guys from Alabama last week, uh-huh. and I, I don't say that in a negative way. I really mean it as a compliment. Because, are, uh, are you kidding I'm me? Trying to cut from the same mold. This guy, this guy is a foozer, is a dear friend, and he's he thinks being called a hillbilly is a badge of honor. He he was offended to be called a redneck, just so you know. So hey, yep. to each his own. Um, right, absolutely. So we could start diving into some foosball questions, and I, sure. one of the one of the first ones here is, why did you get involved in foosball? Well, so in the early '90s, I started the shuffleboard company, mm. and. We were kind of the only, well, we were the only manufacturer in the world at that time. It was small. It was me and two other guys. And the company grew. And we got into the home business. And the company really took off. And it put me into a position where I could start acquiring other companies, small companies. So I bought a pool table manufacturer, a powder manufacturer. And then in 09, Valley Dynamo came up for sale. Brunswick had bought it, moved it down to Mexico, and... The company wasn't doing very well. So I went in and bought it, and I was out on a limb buying that, believe me, Mm -hmm. and uh, didn't sleep well for a while. Mm -hmm. But I went and and moved the company from Mexico back to Fort Worth, where we're at now, and the thing just took off. And Tornado just happened to be one of the brands that was in there with Valley Pool Tables, the Dynamo Air Hockey, and uh, it just kind of came with the package. So we moved all the manufacturing back here to Texas, hired a lot of the uh, people that used to work here and kind of just went from there. So the the idea is our model is as a manufacturer, as we acquired small companies along the way, we were getting the very best brand name and what we thought was the very best product in each of those different lines. So we felt like that under one umbrella, Valley Dynamo, we now own the very best brand names and the very best product in each of those different arenas. My experience, when a portfolio is acquired and there's multiple brands in there, um, you, you only have so much bandwidth. And so, um, if, and I don't want to draw, uh, you know, basically, you, you're a shuffleboard guy, you buy a great company, you, 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 you stress over it, but it turns out that it's working in the right direction. Uh, is, is Tornado rising in your visibility or interest to develop and support? What are your plans for Tornado in the next five years? So, it, yeah, we picked up a lot of, a lot of brands on that, that acquisition. And you look at like our pool table. Well, we shipped 300 pool tables to Vegas and have 8,000 players that come in from all over the world. That's been going on for 35, 36 years. I didn't start it, but, but we support it. We've got pro air hockey players as well, which kind of seems unbelievable, but yeah. we, we cater to those guys too. Mm-hmm. The foosball, although I'm not a player, I mean, I couldn't beat any of you guys that are listening to this right now, but I understand 
the importance of it. Everywhere I go, I hear about how good the table is. And, and you know, our job is to continue the manufacturing pro- process and keep it at that level where everybody's happy. And it's a hard product to build, by the way, too. One of our hardest with the tolerances that we have mm, to keep. Right. So we understand the, the, the players, the league, the tournaments, and I know a lot of people feel like it's the redheaded stepchild. We don't give it the attention and all. We really do. We're probably behind the scenes too much. I met last week with uh, USTSO guys, and we're going to start doing some things uh, probably this year to support them. So we want to we want to change our image and get out there that we're going to be supportive. But you have to understand too, uh, as a businessman. People want free cables. We get a lot of pulls in a lot of different directions for us to do stuff. And it sometimes is tough for us because for every one table we give away, I've got to go sell 10 just to break back even. Wow. So we want to, we want to help, but we've got to have a partnership where we can work together. And the Texas State tournament here, Steve Murray, I mean, they did a great job. We supplied 40 or 50 tables and they sold them all. Well, we can make stuff like that work if we can get in there and cover freight, get some tables out there. We can give away some things, but then when our tables get sold and we can capture a profit, we can at least walk out of there breaking even. And I know the tournament guys, they're not, they're not, uh, you know, making a ton of money doing this. They, uh, they do it cause they love it. And so, you know, again, we want to work with them all that on a, on a sales end. So we look at this, it's really pull through marketing for us. All these, tournaments are going on around the country and it keeps our name out there and our brand and where we're selling is through two distribution channels one of them is our coin op guys that might be one coin op distributor that handle all handles all of our product he might cover a three or four state area so there's not a ton of them across the united states but we sell to those guys but our biggest market is into the home and it's a sought after brand name so Whatever city you happen to be in, if you're in Denver, we'll have uh, maybe two dealers in that city, but we'll have five other dealers that want to carry the tornado name. It's that popular. And those guys are selling tables for the home probably every day. Mm. And, you know, we have a capacity to build about 60 tables a day. And uh, during the Christmas time, you know, we do that. I don't know where they all go, honestly, but... uh they just it's it's just a great product for us and and it has been for years and what, what we wanted to do and that's why we wanted to meet with the USTSO guys is uh see how we can get involved more and more and uh help these guys that are doing tournaments especially we'd like to get these leagues going that's just huge and uh you know they're difficult getting that going in a in a grassroots environment and keeping it going and I, I i'll tell you something else i really like and i don't want to step on anybody's toes or talk out of place because again i don't play in foosball tournaments but i know when i played in shuffleboard tournaments what i used to hate is we would go there to the tournament and i'd be up having to wait around to see when i played for hours you can't do anything else sometimes i get called at 2 a.m and i've got a game and it's so restrictive. I like that. Uh, I think they call it the Swiss style mm-hmm. where you kind of got it all laid out. And so I was talking to these guys. I'd like to, if, if the players are, are okay with that, I'd like to get our company involved and help us here in the States transition to that Swiss style of play. Because I know for me, when I played, man, I'd love it if I knew my schedule and there were you know, not going to be any conflicts and you knew where you were going to play or what time you were going to play. That is exciting to hear. That is so exciting to hear. It has been just a habitual way we've done things, double elimination for decades. And Kelly, you're 100% on board with where we want to go. So truly, and of course, you probably are familiar with a lot of the um, international community has transitioned to the Swiss system for the exact reason you're describing with shuffleboard. Because you can right. sit around for hours not knowing when you're going to play, and then you're just a burnout in a hotel, and you finally get to play. So this is really exciting to hear. Yeah, so that's what we want to do, and we're going to try to encourage everybody to make that transition. And well, I haven't worked out any details yet. We just talked about this last week. But that's what we want to do is get involved, and if you're going to run a Swiss-style type tournament, 
then uh, Tornado Foosball will, will want to be a part of that to help with the transition. Wow. I guess this was part of the question. When I said, where do you think, where do you see foosball in the next five years? Are you saying that you'd like to be, you specifically in, in Valley Dynamo as your company would like to be more participatory in the movement? Go ahead. I want to let you talk. Yeah, we would. We would. And it's got to be, you know, it's got to be reasonable. We just got to get with these guys and work together and explain to them, you know, where we're coming from. A lot of people think that we're just billionaires sitting on some hill printing money. And I mean, that's (laughs) not the case. Yeah. And this pandemic, it's hurt us. I mean, I borrowed money last last year. Wow. uh, You know, we never had to do that in the past, but our coin op sales went down 80 percent with the pandemic. Yeah. So we took a beating. But but again, we uh, and I'm not trying to uh, look for sympathy. I'm just saying the facts are for us to be involved. Again, we're not just back here printing money. So we want to do what's reasonable and we want to help out. But when these guys come to us and they want tables and they can sell them and we don't have to bring them back to our facility. Yeah. Now, that's 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 what we need. We can work with that. So, again, we'll try to figure it out uh, in the next coming weeks. We'll be meeting again, and we'll try to work out some details that everybody can live with. I don't know how it's going to shake out yet. But to answer your question, we expect our sales in foosball to continue to go up, and we would like to be uh, out there more than we are right now, which is fairly limited in helping people do tournaments and especially the league play. To what degree, I don't know, but I think you're going to start seeing a lot more of us out there this year and in the next five years. That is tremendous to hear. And you know what? Uh, I got one last question for you, Kelly, as we get to the, the tail end here of our tam- time together. Thank you again. Yep. Will Tornado be at the World Cup this year? That's the million-dollar question. Yeah, and this fits in timing. The answer is yes, we will. Nice. Now, we were not – we didn't think we were going to be able to, and it came down to – we had to give away a lot of free tables. We've got to pay the freight and everything. And it was just, it was just too dang costly for us. And we're not that big in the European market like we are here in the States. Mm-hmm. So it just didn't make sense for us. But, uh, we had some friends that helped us kind of negotiate a new deal. And I think we're going to be sending, I don't remember the number. It's either 45 or 60, but we're going to send a, a full container load over there. So we'll have, You know, we'll have our tables there for this year's tournament, definitely. Wow. This is an Inside Foos exclusive. The owner of Valley Dynamo committing that we're going to find a way to ensure that Tornado is represented at the World Cup. Kelly, that is uh, incredible news. And, you know, I I don't want this to be understated. I want to make sure that this is clear. Um, There can be a perception, and this is why it's so critical to humanize leadership. There can be a perception that you are some company that's just printing money. And it's even, uh, that perception even grows with, um, you know, certain persons that may or may not understand the operating costs of a business. But it has been very, very illuminating to hear you say, look, our margins are thin in the pandemic, it hurt us. That's important to, to know and hear that. So the community understands, look, hearing you say you had to borrow money, which by the way, I, I work in healthcare and everybody borrowed money during the pandemic. Right. Everybody yeah. did. If you wanted to stay solvent, you borrowed money. That's happened for everybody. So I just, um, you know, I don't want it to be understated. I think it's, uh, it's, um, it was very important, important to hear that. And it'll drive compassion. That Look, you're not out looking for a handout. You're not a victim. You're not looking for anyone to, um, no. you know, feel badly for you. You're just stating the facts that we got to make sure our business remains solvent and your responsibility is broad enough that uh, we've got to make smart decisions. That's it. And it's not giving away free tables. Uh, the whole community can get behind that. And I don't want to be say that we can't do that. I just want to say the math on it is, you know, we, we're a company like most companies. We try to put 10% on the bottom line. You give one table away, you got to sell 10 others to break even. Right. But again, when these guys are getting out there like Steve Murray did, I think we did 50 tables and he sold all 50. Mm-hmm. And we, we did some discounting. The tables are used. And, you know, we can do all that. Yeah. But, um, you know, that just works for us. And we're not having to bring them back in the company. And that's what we want to do is get with the people in the States that want to do these tournaments and all and just work with them. And, uh, you know, do what, what's reasonable where we can, all, we can all come out of there okay. Nobody's going to get rich doing them. But uh, doing the tournaments and all, yeah, right. but uh, we all work together, and you know, let's let's make it happen. This has been a, a lovely, amazing, and important conversation that Inside Foods is proud 
through our various channels to deliver to the international community. And uh, Kelly, I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, unless you have, is there anything else you'd like to say? Other, I mean, now that we're at the tail end here, is there anything else you'd like to say before we sign off? No, I appreciate the time to, uh, you know, to communicate like this. And probably what we ought to do is just set it up. And a couple of times a year, yeah. we, uh, we do the same thing. Just keep everybody up to date on what's going on. Well, Kelly, it has been brilliant. Once again, we're all excited. And thank you so much. We're looking forking forward to the future with Tornado. And uh, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to hearing from you again real soon, sir.